On this week's superhero timeline, I'm dressed in black and sitting on a rooftop and carrying a guitar. So we must be talking about The Crow. That's right, we're going to find out the continuity and timeline of this rather tragic film series and find out whether continuity makes any sense and also find out the story of the easiest and most commonplace Halloween costume of the 1990s. Based on the J.O. Barr comic series of the same name, The Crow first took flight back in 1994 and starts on October 30th, Devil's Night. Winston here is investigating the murder of a young couple and then bounces to one year later. Eric rises from the dead and has flashbacks to the people who killed him and heals instantly from harm. His killers come out to play, yay! And this whole sequence is much more interesting knowing that it was almost entirely shot after the tragic onset death of Brandon Lee. So quick info if you don't know, Brandon Lee, son of Bruce Lee, was killed on set due to a piece of metal lodged in a prop gun, which fired out and struck the actor, killing him. Although most of his scenes were complete, they were forced to use stunt doubles for some scenes and even use some early computer imaging to place him into new scenes like this one right here, but actually hold up pretty well for 1994. Eric starts to get his revenge, taking out Tintin. Whoa! No, not that one. The Candyman is here, and Eric gives John Polito the high hat. And we made our top villain top dollar, and then the crow takes out Fun Boy. And then, T-Bird. He has help from Albrecht and young Sarah, and the Thrill Kill Cult is playing their song After the Flesh live at a club. And I mean, it's in-universe since the song is from the soundtrack, but they were at the peak of their cult popularity in the early 90s, so it was most likely real-time 1994 here. But the movie actually does a pretty good job of doing the whole Batman thing, of playing with the wardrobe and cars and such in order to give the film a timeless feel. At times it feels like it's set in the far past, and other times an apocalyptic future. And Skank here is the last to go, except for the big boss. And they figure out that the crow is Eric's weakness. They shoot it, which takes away Eric's powers, but the crow gets his revenge, and Eric forces Top Dollar to experience all of Shelly's pain at once, and then gets spiked. His mission complete, Eric is reunited with Shelly, and I can only hope it was equally as happy of an ending for Brandon finding peace. Well, The Crow was a smash hit, so a sequel came pretty quickly with 1996, The Crow, City of Angels, and we're in another big, dark city. Okay, so that's a different movie, but still a damn good one. And Sarah's back, now an adult, so it's anywhere from 5 to 10 years after the last one. So, since the original actress was 12 at the time of filming and Mia Kirchner was 21 when they filmed this one, it's fair to say that there's a 9 year difference between the two films, and then this would be set in 2003. Again though, there's still this feeling of timelessness here as the environment feels even more Mad Maxi than the first one. Everything is really dark and dirty, and is able to maintain the same appearance of being futuristic without necessarily having to be set there. There's a new group of gang guys, including a real wild one, and Jubal Early. And our new crow is a man who was killed along with his young son because they were witnesses to a murder. Sarah does his makeup, and Ash seeks his revenge. Although his greatest enemies actually seem to be a receding hairline and the English language. I'll start working emo, and then work my way up the food chain. What? He kills, um, Spider Monkey, and then Nemo, and that's Tom Jane. He just wants his kids back. And I don't know, who, who thought it would be a good idea to have part of Ash's costume be a belly shirt? He gets Callie, and then Curve, and that's when you know for a fact that this is a work of fiction, because let's face it, I'm pretty sure that Iggy Pop's immortal at this point. They capture the crow and kill it, stealing Ash's power. Judah stabs Sarah, and Ash and his half-shirt call out. What? And the crows claim Judah, or something. Sarah dies, and... <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Is that a real effect that they used? Oh, okay. 
Ash returns to death and then reunites with his son. It took four more years to get another sequel off the ground with 2000's The Crow Salvation, although this one didn't get a wide release. MJ Watson and a man with no dick go to watch the execution of Alex Corvus on his 21st birthday. He's accused of killing his girlfriend three years ago and electrocuted, and is brought back horribly burned, but heals up into the familiar crow look. He uses his powers to find out the real killers, and then we find out that Lauren died in 1997, and since we know that she died three years ago, that places this one in 2000. So it's most likely set a little before the last one, which I guess would explain why everything looks a little less apocalyptic. I guess it's also possible that using the kind of aimless time frame of the first two movies, that this could be either set in a separate continuity, or much, much, much more in the future, or much farther in the past than those either. He meets the Dunst, and even though she watched him die, she doesn't recognize him. I mean, the scars aren't that extreme. She doesn't recognize the guy she thought killed her sister that was all over the news and media, because he now has three lines across his face. Tommy here doesn't recognize him either, so I guess it's some sort of an enchantment. And then he starts to get his revenge as Lauren's killers include Goggins and Lewis Creed. In case there was any doubt, this car's registration shows the current year as 2000, and then Remo Williams pops in as the leader of the corrupt cops. And Lauren's dad's involved, of course. It takes a good hour for Alex to kinda look like the character, and Thornburg commits suicide, then kills more of the corrupt cops, although in this movie, um, they're they're all kind of corrupt, I guess. Oddly enough, when he thinks his job is done, he loses his powers, which is weird because Eric thought his job was done in the first film at one point, and he still retains his powers. So I was under the assumption that the resurrection had lasted until the job was done. But when he finds out that there's one more involved, his powers still don't come back for some reason, so I'm not sure how this whole thing works. After nearly dying again, his power is restored, and Dunst is staying three feet away from Ward and somehow manages to merely nick his ear with a shot. The captain is the man Alex is looking for, so they electrocute him, which sets him free, and the tombstone further confirms the 2000 date as we close out this chapter. Another five years pass, and in 2005 we get the final film chapter so far with the crow, Wicked Prayer and introduces us to a biker gang known as the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, as they free Angelus along with the, um, unique acting styles of Tara Reid, and then, oh wow, John Connor's in this too? This one's gonna be f chock full of fantastic acting. However did the producers pull off just that much talent? Pecker has a calendar up which doesn't say the year on it, but the days line up with how they fell in 2003, so it's possible that that's our year, and it's also possible that it's just an old calendar. If it is 2003, we're set basically at the same time as the second one, but things just don't seem as dark as destroyed, so I guess it's possible that this is a different continuity, seeing as how it's not linked to any other of the other three, and again it's also possible that part two could be set in either a more distant future or a more distant past, again because it doesn't really look like it's any specific time frame. Machete shows up, and pause on this magazine cover over here, as it's an old magazine called Razor, and this issue is from February 2003, so it's looking like that is when we are set. The gang attacks Jimmy Cuervo. Seriously, that... That's what they went with? And kill his girlfriend, and then him. But, because you're watching a movie called The Crow, he comes back and gears up and then... <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe because it's Edward Furlong, but this is just more like, like, lost goth than it is the crow. Jimmy kills Pestilence and then, oh, look how cute. I mean, he's, he's really trying to look menacing, but it's just really not working. He kills Famine, they hurt the crow, so Jimmy loses his powers, and then for some reason, Macy Gray appears, and 
Dennis, come on. Did you really need the money? War dies, and then death becomes Lucifer and has powers which mostly consume of hamming it up. Awkward dancing. Trejo restores the crow. The sun rises, and the spell is broken, and Luke is killed. His vengeance complete, Jimmy then passes on to reunite with Lily. So, of course, since this is based on a comic book, of course, there's more media featuring this character, including the original comic series that the first film is based on. Afterwards, there were literally dozens of other series, including multiple versions of the characters, like in the films, including crossovers with other companies. There were also novels and video games, and, and also a very short-lived one-season TV series titled Crow, Stairway to Heaven. It's basically a retelling of the events of the first film, yet sanitized for a syndicated audience. It starred Mark Dacascos as Eric. Oddly enough, the show did include the Skull Cowboy character that was cut from the original film. In that one, he was portrayed by Michael Berryman in elaborate makeup. In the show, he's Dwayne Wayne in an elaborate hat. There's also been several attempts to either remake or reboot the film, including a most recent version featuring Jason Momoa. That version was unfortunately cancelled after quite a bit of pre-production, and it uh, looks like that we are going to have to wait a little while to see this character take flight once again. So there you have it, it's four movies that are kind of only marginally linked. The first two have a basic continuity, but the other two, the other two don't. They're really more anthology-esque than anything. Um, you know, from a timeline aspect, you can kind of take what I said with these, uh, especially the first two, you can take the years I said them in, but you can also pretty much place them in any year. I mean, they kind of have that really timeless quality to them that, that you could place those at whatever point in history that you want. That's kind of the interesting thing about the way that they shot it. Um, but I mean, I, I enjoyed all these. Um, the second one was a little bit boring. Um, I guess there's a director's cut of it they say is better, but I've read a synopsis of it and it doesn't really seem that big of an improvement. Um, and the fourth one is really kind of uh, probably the worst one, but actually it's really funny because of how bad it is. Um, but the first one is, is a classic that you can't go wrong with, and I really enjoyed the third one. Um, but uh, that's about it for this week's video. Hope you liked it. Let me know what you thought of these down below. Uh, let me know your thoughts about uh, the Brandon Lee tragedy. Um, let me know, uh, should send me pictures of yourself in a ridiculous Crow, crow costume, because, I mean, there was a point in time where you couldn't go to a Halloween costume where every third person wasn't in a Crow costume. But I guess, uh, well, I guess that's it for this week's video, and I guess I don't need this anymore. I stole this. Uh, it's not Day of the Dead, though, so I think it'll be okay. And I guess, uh, I guess my Daddy. work here is done, and... Daddy. Oh, oh, hi. <laughs> hi, oh. Are you here for, for me? Yeah, are you ready? I, I, yeah, I guess I guess I'm moving on. Okay. Um, with, 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 with.